Welcome, Sarah. Thank you very much. Hello from sunny Tenerife. <laughs> um, I mean, the big question is, like, which is always a pretty big answer, what have you been up to? Like, what's been happening? Oh, Henry, the last what have year? you been up to? Okay, I'll, 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 sort of, I'll bullet point it and then we can go into more detail of what you'd like to know. We're now arranging assessments direct into prisons. We're doing that a lot. Um, we're doing it for parents. We're doing it for probation, actually, have even paid us to do assessments. Uh, we're doing it for partners um, and all sorts of people. And some of the clients actually in prison themselves are paying for their own ADHD and very often ASD assessments as well, because they're so fed up waiting for the prisons uh, who are basically misdiagnosing them or worse, not diagnosing them. I don't know what's worse, actually, miss or not. But they're either getting diagnosed with personality disorders or nothing. So we now have several psychiatrists. They're all ex-prison service and they are now doing um, assessments direct into prisons. That's a large amount of my job now. What I do is arrange these assessments. A lot of them are before court. So these people inside know they've got these conditions, but they can't get them diagnosed and they need them diagnosed before they go to court. So we're doing a lot of that. The other thing we're doing tons of is work with the police. Um, full credit to the police here in the UK and also Australia. I'll talk to you about that as well. But um, we're now working with, I think it's about 36 police forces um, who are all going to start screening for ADHD in their police stations and ideally catching people the first time rather than the 30th time they go into a police station. So we're working with people like Greater Manchester Police, uh, West Midlands Police, Police Scotland, really, really big forces. Um, and they're all going to start screening. So we're, we're screening um, in different ways. Some people are uh, screening through their LMD, liaison and diversion teams. Some are screening children. Police Scotland are screening everybody. Um, Police Scotland have got the highest suicide rate in the uh, in Europe, and they think that is largely down to undiagnosed ADHD. So that's why they're starting to screen everybody in Police Scotland. So we're working with the police, setting up pilots. We're also setting up pilots with homeless organisations. Um, I will tell you the two, uh, the big issue and crisis, um, which thrills me because I used to work for both of them or volunteer for both of them. I, I was Years and years I worked with crisis doing um, oh, I was hairdressing services manager first. Then I was entertainment services manager, did all sorts of things for crisis at Christmas. So crisis are going to do a homeless pilot for us, which is amazing. And also the big issue. Uh, the big issue is where I started my helping career nearly 30 years ago. So the homeless uh, world are starting to do pilots and the addiction world. When I say pilots, I'm talking ADHD screening pilots because in the criminal justice system, the addiction world and the homeless world, there's a huge crossover. Most of the people in there have experienced one, two or, or three of those sort of areas, i.e. most prisoners come out and are homeless. A lot of prisoners come out and have got addiction issues. So we're doing pilots in all these different areas to try and prove to the government one thing, and that one thing is that ADHD screening needs to be mandatory in all these services, particularly in the criminal justice system, uh, because people are going back to prison time after time, after time, after time, because they've got undiagnosed ADHD and they are costing the government a fortune. Whereas the people that we are getting screened through the charity and diagnosed and medicated, they never offend again. There's a surprise. They're all out, they're working, they're earning money and they're doing brilliantly. So that's primarily what I've been up to. I'm also just writing my fourth book, um, which is going to be about my experience in the prisons and how much ADHD was in the prisons, which is off the scale. And the one thing I will say before I shut up um, is that the one in four figure really needs to be put in the dustbin now. The one in four figure is utterly irrelevant. It is not one in four people in prison who have uh, ADHD. It is more like 85%. All our pilots, trials, screening, everything is coming out either at 85% or slightly over. I missed out probation in there, by the way. Sorry, we're working with several probations and they are starting to screen as well. And they are all, well, the, the ADHD probation officers themselves are not surprised that it's coming out so high because they, they recognise it in all the, their clients. But the people who are not ADHD probation officers, when they're screening, they're saying, 
we can't believe this. It's nearly all of them. And we're like, yeah, we've been telling you this for years, but nobody's been listening. But now, thankfully, people are listening. So probation is another um, people, organization that we're passionate about working with. So if there's any probation officers listening to this, please get in touch with us. We can set you up screening. Doesn't cost a penny. And it's not only going to stop the offender offending again, it's going to make the probation officer's job easy because they're not then constantly worrying, oh, God, is he going to get recalled? Is he going to go and punch a police officer again? No, because once they're diagnosed and medicated, the vast majority don't commit crime ever again. So we're trying to make probation officers' lives easier by offering them screening. And the ones we're working with are all wonderful, but they are all very shocked because the probation screening pilots are coming out at well over 85%. As I have said since I left the prison system in 2016, it's pretty much all of them. And it is pretty much all of them. So that's what I'm doing, Henry. <laughs> and, uh, and as I said, it was gonna, it was, it's, a, it's always a lot. And writing <laughs> the book as well, not the fourth. Um, yeah. Yeah, look, the, you know, we talk about ADHD and you know, we see people falling out of education, falling into crime. We have a massive problem about the lack of, um, the lack of uh, monitoring. So the fact that we don't know, we don't in schools we don't know how many ADHD kids there are. We don't know their outcomes. We don't know that they're falling out. We don't, you know, have the numbers saying that this higher proportion is being excluded. But we we know it from our, yeah. our own. Um, well, can uh, I just add the, into that list of things that we're doing? We go into schools a lot and train teachers. Um, so this is I'm very passionate about training teachers, and we do it all over the place. Um, in the UK, abroad, I went to Scotland, Aberdeen last year, training teachers. So training teachers is something we're very, very passionate about because we too are massively keen on stopping this school to prison pipeline because the school to prison pipeline is chock a block with neurodiversity, primarily ADHD. But there are other things in there as well. There's definitely autism in there as well and other things. Um, but yes, teachers is is an area that we're massively passionate about. We go into a lot of schools and I'll tell you the very interesting thing about that is. I have had several Senko teachers who've come up to me at the end of the two and a half hours. It is usually training. One of them said these actual words. She said, Sarah, I've been a Senko for 20 years and I've had Senko training for 20 years. And everything that you've just told me in there in that two and a half hours, she said, I didn't know any of that. And I said, dear God, what have they been teaching you in Senko training for yeah. 20 years that you didn't know any of what I've just told you? And she said, all they teach us about is hyperactivity and distraction and lack of focus and how to manage it. And that's all they teach. They don't teach anything about emotional yeah. dysregulation, the higher self-harm rates, the higher suicide rates. They don't teach any of the important stuff to these Senko teachers. So when we go and train Senko teachers, they love it because they find out really what ADHD is. And they all, all of them, I mean, we've had them in tears, some of them. We've had them actually in tears yeah. who've said, I now can see years ago, all the kids that I've missed you know, that I've told off for daydreaming, told off for doodling, told off of I, one child I know of used to have his legs tied to the chair because he was so hyperactive. This is back in the 70s, 80s. But he used to have his legs tied with rope to the chair to keep him sitting down in school, you know, and some of these teachers, well, all of them, you know, all the ones that we train, once we've just shown them exactly what ADHD is and how to manage it and how to speak to an ADHD person. And it's not difficult. Once you understand how an ADHD brain works and we teach them how to yeah. interact with it to get the best out of an ADHD child, they're all like, it's not rocket science, is it? It's not, it's not hard, but nobody's told us this stuff. So, yes, te teaching teachers is a big passion of ours and we're doing a lot of it. It's obviously critically important. Like, and uh, that's a horrifying story about the, the tying to the chair. And it, it reminded yeah. me of the um, councillors who were um, on camera uh, debating the, uh, the costs of that council for special educational provision and complaining that they didn't have these problems previously perhaps it was something in the water that the little i think it was little willy need like it just needs to be told off and it's, uh, yeah just needs uh, to be and, uh, parented like, properly and brought up properly yeah, yeah. and the reasons that, but, but that, that clear reason the reason that weren't these problems before was because you were tying people to chairs like you weren't going understanding their true 
issue yeah. and you're infecting. And sending them out of the classroom, or in, in my junior school, everybody that I now know was ADHD, when I look back to the 11 and 12 year olds, they were all carted off to the special needs school, you know, because of their yeah. behaviour. Had anybody understood that that behaviour was, in, from what I can tell, all of them were ADHD, the ones I remember being carted off. You know, one of them was a girl and she told the, the deputy head to F off once uh, in library. That was her gone off to the special school, you know. <laughs> and I, I, to be honest, I always say to people, I don't blame people for being ignorant, genuinely ignorant about ADHD, because at the time when that girl was carted off to the special school, I sat there thinking, oh, well, I would never tell the deputy head to F off because I've been brought up properly. She obviously hasn't, you know. And yet there was I sitting there with my moderate to severe ADHD. But just because I could manage mine and she couldn't manage hers, she gets carted off and I didn't. But I, I was as judgmental as the rest. I used to think, oh, these kids, for heaven's sake, don't they know how to behave? You know, my, my mother, I always say I was more frightened of my mother than I was of any school. So I behaved at school because I knew if I, a message got sent home, I'd misbehaved at school. I would be in for it when I got home. So that's why I behaved. Um, but yes, the, 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 the ignorance, and I use the word in the proper sense of the, you know, sense of it, the ignorance yeah. has been shocking over the years. And tragically, I always say this to people, I failed my 12 plus um, 1975 because of undiagnosed dyscalculia, because of undiagnosed ADHD. Now, wouldn't it be great to say, but everything's changed now, you know, we're recognising ADHD, we're recognising dyscalculia, we're recognising... No, we're not. Nothing's changed since 1975. Nothing. So teachers aren't being trained to spot ADHD. I, I was always told, you're really good at English. You're just not trying in maths. Just try harder. Concentrate. Focus. You know, but it wasn't. It was because I had dyscalculia. But nobody had worked that out. And that's why I failed the 12 plus as well. Because people with dyscalculia, like me, when somebody asked them how many grapes and bananas and, and strawberries has Rory got, because Rosie's got three, eight and ten of each, my brain goes, I don't give a shit. I don't care. Not interested in Rosie and her apples. I don't care. So that's dyscalculia. I didn't realise until I was in my 50s. That was why I failed my 12 plus. Now, are kids being picked up for dyscalculia in schools now? No. Not a chance. Out of interest, Not what was your opinion on uh, um, Rishi Sunak's plan that everyone take A-level maths? I think that's absolutely fine unless you've got dyscalculia. So if, if, you are, if you are going to lay down laws like that, fine. As long as you're screening kids for all these conditions and you've worked out which ones can easily do that. I mean, I got A's in my English O levels and U in my maths. There's a surprise. Yeah. I mean, one, one of the indicators of ADHD is wildly differing grades. A for English, ungraded for maths, and nobody thought to look and think, hello, what, what's wrong yeah. there? You know, but as I say, this was 1975. It's no different now. This is what drives us insane. Yeah, it's, it's no different. Is it, uh, yeah, and you were talking about the Senkos earlier. I did a, a spot on LBC and... Um, this in that case it's quite common you know this sort of presenter who doesn't believe and I always know I've won when they go uh oh this this is something I need to learn a lot more about and I've got uh, it myself usually uh, well, yeah <laughs> not, not, not for that one. but then um the calls then the, I, I was stayed on for the hour and the calls were um uh, the, the first three calls were all Senkos all of whom who had learned they'd had ADHD not through their Senko training but through when their own child uh, received a diagnosis and then for the first time they really learned what it was yeah. and then they went well that's me <laughs> like, and, you know that same thing though that said to me i've just learned in two and a half hours what i haven't learned in the last 20 yeah. years senko training she also said to me she said by the way i've got dyslexia in two of my girls now i say everybody with dyslexia has got adhd i have yet to meet somebody with dyslexia who doesn't so i always say this in my presentations you know bring me that person with dyslexia who doesn't have adhd there's a prize waiting when we I, find I, that I can't i can't talk to that i can't i don't have the stats but i do know that it was a recent um uh, study, I believe, from a university in Scotland showing that there are some genetic ties between dyslexia and ADHD. Massive. Uh, and, so and there's the also a massive connection. There's a massive connection between ADHD and the Celts. And I include the Irish and the Scots in that. Um, massive. 
So, but that lady, what she said oh, to me no um, at the end of the chat, she said, not only have I realised, you know, two and a half hours later, I now know what I should, what I can go back to my school and actually interact with the ADHD kids because I now know about it and I didn't before. But she also said, I've got dyslexia, so have my two daughters. Thank you very much. I've just realised we've all got ADHD as well. You know, mm. so she was a Senko mm. who knew she had dyslexia, but didn't know she had ADHD. And she's been a Senko for 20 years working with these kids and she didn't even know she got ADHD herself. I mean, what hope is there? It's 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 raising awareness. Yes, we all have to do it and we have to keep doing it big time because there's so much genuine ignorance around. And this is obviously this is ADHD Awareness Month. That's why we're doing this. Uh, and I have to like, you do sort of look at Awareness Month together. You know, we do this every other month also. <laughs> like, this every is, this day, is Henry. I do it every single day. Yeah, yeah. We both I spend yeah. my life doing it and I'm passionate about doing it. I've done it here in Tenerife. You know, the, the receptionist, I said, he said, what do you hear for us? I'm here to write my fourth book. He said, on what ADHD? He went, oh, I think I've got that. I said, do you? Five minutes later, yes, we know he's got that. You know, it's everywhere. Even coming in at the tax, this is fascinating. On the taxi. Well, we are, we are, we are a big group of people, right? Like, Massive. We're, in but the we're UK, it's 2.6 million. Taxi, million, taxi one, yesterday, Gatwick. Yeah. Lovely taxi man tells me that his daughter is diagnosed ADHD. I said, okay. I said, where did that come from? Then you are a mum. He said, it's not me. I said, well, let me tell you some of the traits. Reeled off a load of the traits. It's his wife screaming. He said, she spends all my money. She's a shopaholic. The house is full of rubbish that we don't need. I said, it's your wife. And then he started to talk about the, his his grandson and, I, and it, about his sensory issues. He won't hardly eat anything. He won't do this, won't do that. I said, it's your grandson as well. See, even him with a diagnosed daughter, who I think is about 30 now, he did not realise that it's hereditary. So he didn't even think to look at him or his wife or his grandson. You know, so there was two yeah. that I diagnosed, not diagnosed, but recognised, flagged up in the taxi on the way to the airport yesterday. And the receptionist, as soon as I get here. But these people, they know they've got all these things going on in their heads and, and stuff, but they don't know what it is. Now, look, you're obviously doing some good identification of ADHD in perception taxi. And, but like the Everywhere. stuff you're doing in prisons is a yep. big deal. and the, the screening is a big deal. Yep. Uh, and uh, And that's where you're looking to identify um, yeah. uh, ADHD in people coming into the criminal justice system they have been brought yeah. in by the police and doing the screening yeah. um, and you've got the bottleneck of assessments and so you are uh, who pay yours you said you're doing assessments in prisons who's paying well for uh, as I say lots of different people pay so very often it's the partner if it's if it's an adult man you know we've got one lady who's paid for her partner to be diagnosed lots of parents mostly it's parents paying because right. they know so that they're Sorry. So this is a private, it's a private assessment being done well, in the prison is, service because I mean, we're, of the absolute we're, we're failure of the prison work, They actually pay the psychiatrist or psychologist or whoever to diagnose. We, as in the charity, we don't charge for arranging this. So it, it takes a lot. I, I spend all day every day doing it, put it that way. But we don't charge for that bit. The only bit that gets charged for is the actual assessment. So largely it's parents who are paying. It's also partners. It's grandfathers. We've got a grandfather at the moment paying for one for his grandson. Yeah. And also, on occasion, very rarely, but it has happened, probation. Because if probation have realised that somebody has got ADHD and that is why they keep re-offending, they will actually put their hand in the pocket and pay for an assessment. So we've had probation pay as well. Now, people have some pretty uh, challenging, um, if they're opting for medication with shared care to their GP, like that must be at a whole nother level in the prison service. How does that work? Where do I, Where do we start with that? Meds so that is prison. a challenge though. Meds, yes, it's a challenge. It's, it's a challenge, but it's not ungettable over. Uh, meds in prison, any meds, have 10 times the value they would on the street. Yeah. So you, you yeah. can chirter that you might be able to flog for three quid a pill. I don't know how much people flog them for after. I've no idea. But let's say you flog it for three quid. In prison, that'll be 30 quid. So they have very, very high value in prison. Yeah. Now, um, we... But, we the, but the core is that kid, the people can get that medication they can. The, the problem is, let me, give, very, you, very let me give you a, a brilliant example, though, Henry. I had two of my boys um, who went into the same prison. Now, they I, I won't mention the prison. I should be discreet. But it's a prison in England. One of them went in on his medication. So he had his medication in his pack, you know, his, his um, little suitcase thing with him. The other one didn't. But they were both diagnosed by the same psychiatrist, both paid for by our charity. The one that was on meds was allowed to be kept on meds. 
The one that wasn't on meds, he's still in there, he's still in this prison, they will not medicate him, despite him showing them his diagnosis letter, and despite the psychiatrist ringing up the prison and saying to them, I diagnosed him, he's severely ADHD, please put him on medication. They won't. That's the problem with what's going on in the prisons. It's very, very inconsistent. I will say there are, I hear there are some prisons that are very, very good, that are assessing, they are diagnosing, they're not getting it wrong and saying they've all got personality disorders, which is a big problem. Mm -hmm. But some of them are getting it right. They're actually diagnosing them with ADHD and they are medicating. That is rare. The vast majority are either not being assessed and diagnosed. We've got numerous boys asking for assessments in prisons and prisons are now just saying, we don't do it. We can't diagnose, you know, we just, we can't do it. We haven't got the staff, we haven't got the expertise, which is why we're having to do it on the outside. Um, and then a lot yeah. of them, who was it said to me this week? Somebody said to me this week, I think it was a probation officer or a neurodiversity manager in a prison, one of the two. One of them said to me, you do know in this prison, as soon as they arrive, we take them off their ADHD meds. And I said, well, no, I don't, because every prison operates independently. They don't all work the same. This is what people get very wrong. So some prisons, you know, you, you will turn up like my one boy did and they will keep him on his meds. And they did for the whole three months he was in there. The other boy has been in for the best part of a year. Can't get them to put him on meds, despite the psychiatrist ringing and saying, I mm. diagnosed them both. You've got one on meds and one not. Put them both on. And they won't. And what does that make you feel like? Look, you're doing pioneering work in screening to help identify people who've been missed in their school system or, or and earlier to yeah. get them that intervention that can be life changing. And yeah. you're hearing that in the prison service is just saying no. How, how do you feel? feel Henry, I'll tell you how it makes me feel. It, 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 this is how it makes me feel. Two weeks ago, I was at an inquest in Nottingham for one of my young offenders from Aylesbury when I worked there 10 years ago. And they would not put him on his medication. Two prisons, not just one. That the, I'd put safeguarding risk letters into one prison and then safeguarding risk letters into the second prison. I'd done five in total for safeguarding risk letters. And each one in the, on the top, in bright red letters, it had safeguarding risk due to not being on the right ADHD medication. And two weeks, three weeks ago, I was at his inquest, Henry, because he hung himself. And he, about three years before that, he set fire to himself because his emotional dysregulation was so bad. We had begged, we had pleaded, we had sent letters to the governors, to mental health, to psychologists, to psychiatrists, to the head of safer custody. Now, some people might not know what safer custody is. In a prison, safer custody are the people who are supposed to pe keep people in custody safe, i.e. alive. So we kept sending letters to safer custody saying he's a safeguarding risk, he's a safeguarding risk. Well, on March the 6th last year, he hung himself because he was so dysregulated. And if you ask me how it makes me feel, it makes me feel two things in equal 50-50. One, extremely angry. And the other half of me is extremely sad because we are letting boys and girls, 5% of the prison population is girls. They're nearly all ADHD as well. But we are letting yes. these people down and we are risking their lives by not medicating them in prison. Something I will just say, of the two boys I just talked about, the one that was kept on his meds in prison, this was his 16th visit to prison, age 29. And it was the only time he was put on enhanced. Now, that will only mean something to people who've worked in prisons. When you go into prison, you're on standard. If you're naughty, you get put down to basic. You lose your television, you lose visits, you lose canteen, you lose things. But if you're good, you get raised up and you get put onto enhanced. That means you get more visits, more time out of your cell, more minutes on your phone for phoning people. It means all sorts of little nice things. Well, the boy that was in there for the 16th time and we'd got him diagnosed by our charity on the outside, so he was on his medication, he phoned me up one day and he went, Sarah, I'm on enhanced. I've never been on enhanced ever. Now, that was because every other time he wasn't diagnosed and medicated. So he was kicking off, punching people, thumping walls, you know, ripping sinks off the wall. All these things they do just to pass the time because they're so bored. Um, and he was staggered, this boy, that he was on enhanced for the first time. And I said, that is because of the meds. It's the meds. He didn't, he didn't understand it. He was like, why am I on enhanced? I said, it's because of the meds. Because you're not kicking off, love, are you? You're not ripping things up. You're not punching people. You're not telling people to F off. You're not getting into fights. So this is the other thing the prisoners don't realise. If you diagnose and medicate somebody, their behaviour improves. That makes prison officers safer. 
they are less likely to get stabbed or punched or kicked or whatever because once we're on the meds and once these boys are on the meds all the fight goes out of them they, they, they're not bothered about fighting anymore they're chill they're happy and they don't want to get into trouble you know they can they can they can uh, stop the impulsivity and the heightened sense of justice calms down so by not medicating diagnosing and medicating people for adhd in prison one of the things we're doing is putting officers more at risk you know of an, an unmedicated adhd person we're also costing the government in this country and australia i'll come on to australia in a minute um tens of millions of pounds if we would just diagnose these people get the right diagnosis get them medicated get them out that boy who'd been in prison 16 times before the age of 29 he's now been out for four years he's on his meds he's working he's got a relationship he's got children and he says i will never go back to prison again and i believe him because he's now diagnosed and medicated so this is the message we've got to get through to the government that you're wasting so much money and you're putting officers and other offenders in prison at risk by not diagnosing and medicating those that have got adhd simple as that you can hear like in your answers like you're trying to work out which what are the levers to pull because like, you're seeing people devastating obviously but they're taking people you've known taking their own life and yeah. and um yeah, so I can, I can hear and you looking for everything you can to say like look affecting prison officers affecting the prisoners like what what are the, what, it's, it's also what affecting the public Henry. it's affecting the public you know yeah, it's it affects the public because we, yeah. if we don't diagnose and medicate people, they are going to be back out there getting drunk. This particular one, his problem, was not, he was self-medicating his ADHD with alcohol. So when he was drunk, you know, he got accused of fighting, affray, punching people, blah, blah, blah. Now he doesn't touch alcohol because he doesn't need to because he's on the meds and he doesn't need that self-medication anymore. And he's the, the public are safer. So it's the public that benefit as well. Everybody benefits by diagnosing and medicating offenders everybody benefits i think the there's an important um you know that an important point of the impact of adhd and in the prison service you're going to be seeing those people who have had very very significant impacts from their adhd and that that co yeah. um you know, one of the things i do think about adhd is that it is a it is a poverty making uh condition like that mm -hmm. it can push you into poverty and keep you there keep you and because of the genetic aspects it can keep you your entire um family there like and 100 um, yeah and, and here we have you know reached the modern age where we have awareness of adhd we have tools that can make it make a difference and yet we have you know in sheffield where they have over six thousand people on the wait list and last year they only saw three people so they have an effective wait in my mind when I read an effective that. wait time of two thousand plus years and yeah. it's just you know, here where I sit, you can't even join the ADHD um, uh, uh, list. They've closed it. Like, and you're having to intervene where, you know, we talk about massive failures in schools, in uh, um, prisons, and the commonality they have is that those are government-run institutions who are just abjectly failing um, the community of people with ADHD yeah. are failing other communities also, but like they are yeah. failing us enormously and they have the complete control. And yeah. we took, we say like, go, we, you know, an assessment can be life changing and who again controls the assessments and it's them. Yeah, and absolutely. It's, it's, it and I'll tell you something, something that completely feeds into yeah. what you've just said. Nearly every boy I've worked with in prisons, is, I've got nothing against girls. It's just I've only worked in four male prisons. All of them come from what was very obviously undiagnosed ADHD parents. And now most of the boys mm -hmm. in prisons have either come from the care system, they've been removed from chaotic living houses. A lot of the boys in prison are very short because they've not been fed properly as children. One of them, two brothers I work with, one was five foot seven and one was five foot four. And they were given injections in prison to strengthen their bones because their bones were so weak. Now the reason for that, because I counseled the older one, was that the mother was an alcoholic and was dead by the time the one I was working with was 24. And the father had died before that. He was an alcoholic and a drug addict. Now, obviously both ADHD undiagnosed. The entire, all the children from that family are all ADHD. So I can only assume that the parents are both ADHD as well. And then where did the two brothers end up? 
they end up in prison because their parents have gone. A lot of people in prison, they don't have mums. That is the very, um, that's the, the commonality thing. Some of them have got dads, but that doesn't seem to matter. And a lot of them have got dads that have, have left years ago. They either don't know who their dad is or their dad's gone. But the mum, once the mum dies, and it's always from addiction, it's always from alcohol, it's nearly always alcohol. And these boys lose their parent around about 15, 16. That's a standard sort of age. And then after that, they don't think anybody cares about them. They don't think their life's worth living. So they just, everything goes to pot. And then they end up in prison, 17, 18. And then it's sadly the revolving door until they are diagnosed and medicated. Now we are catching some of these in between. I'm having to force my way into some families who still don't believe in ADHD. And I'm like, excuse me, when you've been to prison 15 times, I think there might be ADHD there. So I force myself in. I meet these people in the most random places. A lot of people won't come to my therapy room, but they will meet, in the, meet, meet, meet me in the pub. So I meet people in pubs. And I have sessions in pubs trying to say, look, this is potentially where your offending behavior is coming from. Have a chat with me and we'll, you know, we'll work it out. So, yes, the, the like you're saying, it is the big institutions that are failing people. The good news is, though, we're doing a lot of training in the care system, uh, adopt, adoption services, fostering services. These sorts of people, they are starting to realize that they have a much higher ratio of ADHD than standardly and that is of course because these children have been removed usually from either chaotic living neglect um alcoholic drug addicts yeah drug and it's users, often it's a, and it's adhd and right like so it's that yeah that, that completely of, of additional challenges yeah. and as well like that can, yeah. can be now look we are overrunning on time uh, okay. and <laughs> you are in tenerife you're going to australia We've got a video yes. um, that you've made to show people, so yes. we're going to show that now. Then we'll talk yeah. briefly about what what you're what you're doing, uh, and um, and then we'll have to say goodbye. And we've managed to go absolutely over time, no but because like obviously what you're talking about is extraordinary. Yeah. Well, can I just mention? Hello. Oh, okay. I have Play big news for our friends down under. More than any other country in the whole world, ever since I started writing books, this was the first one. This is the one that people got the hump about the title. Well, only certain people, boring people. Most people laughed and thought it was hysterical, including kids. So this one was the first book I wrote. Then I had loads of parents saying, please write one for teachers. So I did. This was the second book I wrote for teachers. And that one is selling all over the world a little more gently because obviously teachers don't, they don't have the time and a lot of them think they know about ADHD anyway but parents are buying it for the teachers which is fabulous then my final book has just come out well I say final no it's this is the third of seven I've got seven that I want to write uh, this is the third one so what I'm doing is I'm doing what the Australians have asked me to do I'm coming to see you I'm coming to Australia I'm giving you plenty of notice I'm coming in February and March 2025 I have a fabulous new American book publicist who is organising all this. So I will be coming to wait for it, Adelaide because I've had more requests from Adelaide than anywhere else and Adelaide happens to be my favourite city in Australia. I'm also going to Melbourne uh, because again, love Melbourne and it's close. Then to good old Sydney because one's got to go and see the Opera House again and then I should be going up to the Gold Coast, not just to see Peter Andre who might be hanging around but because I love the Gold Coast. So I'm going to all those four places in Australia. So if you happen to be in any of those places and you have a school, your kids are at school or university or college or even work, if you want somebody to come and do training, somebody to come and do a presentation, I'm coming because you've asked me. You've begged. I've had people begging for about four years now. So I thought, sod it. I'm getting old. I'm going to come to Australia. So February and March 2025, I will be down under. And if you want me to come and talk at your school or you've got teachers or you've got parents or you've got uh, employers or you've got anybody who doesn't understand about ADHD and you want me to come and do a short a long, a medium presentation with question and answer sessions. I will be doing it. I'll also be doing book signings in loads of shops. So there'll be loads of books to buy. Um, and I really look forward to seeing you down in Australia, as they say it, um, in February and March 2025. See you. There we go. We're back. Hello. Okay. Um, 
the um, that was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I cut you off. Um, but That's so okay. Tell us quickly. We have overrun on time. So tell us quickly uh, about Australia, Australia, what you're doing. Okay. We'll well, say, I'm going to Australia for two months, as you probably just saw. Um, largely because a lot of mums have asked me to. So a lot of mums who read my books, they say, if you think things are bad in the UK, Sarah, please God, come to Australia. Now in Australia, well, we're obviously we've got this is in partnership with ADHD Australia. So exactly, um, so they probably know all about this. Together. So um, I've said I've been for, for about four years. Mums have been saying, please come to Australia. Please come and talk to our teachers. Please come and and. and it started off as a book tour but it's actually turning out really to be a criminal justice system tour because we've had we've had queensland police we've had um melbourne police we've had several police forces contact us and they're very very interested in screening because obviously they've got the same problem here we've also had people in america contact us but they've said it's going to be a much more difficult job in america because we're much tougher on crime however in australia they're very interested in starting to screen so i want to go and talk to as many probations as many police forces as many anybody who will talk to me about why this is critical and how it will change their entire criminal justice system so i'm going to be there for two months um and i just welcome anybody to get in touch um and please let me come and talk or give training presentations or q a sessions whatever mm -hmm. but um either teachers or the criminal justice system that's what i'm going there to hopefully help the adhd awareness along you're amazing look and obviously everyone's seen the passion with which you and uh, with which you talk um they'll you know, they know they're getting something very special if they if they get you in. So um, we've got to part company um, because we're, we're out of time. We were out of time a little while ago. But hey, uh, the um, uh, you are an absolute force of nature. Like you are creating change in an area of such import. It's uh, you know it is. Revolutionising. Because I care lives. about them, Henry. I care deal. about them. They're very, the top of my list offenders. People stuck in prison because of their undiagnosed ADHD. They're the very, very top of my list, and they're the, they're not top of many people's list, but they're top of mine. And I won't stop until they're all getting screened, assessed, diagnosed, and medicated in prison. Then I'll stop, but I won't stop till then. It's people getting the, the support they should be getting again when we're talking yeah. about trying to change reoffending yeah. rates. We understand what went wrong before, and try. You know, you have this sort of you know beacon of this is an intervention point that can make yeah. an enormous difference and just we're doing it we're proving it we're, we're proving it with in. loads of police forces probations we're proving it there's no question most offenders have got adhd there's no question we've just got to sort that problem out now which we are doing right you started this conversation by saying come on let's get on with this i have a sunbed with my name on it that i need I to do. go to and, and a book to write you, more importantly a book to write about the amount of ADHD so. in prisons that's what I'm doing now um so we're gonna, we're gonna let you get back to both thank you for joining us obviously thank you for your work you're you are incredible what you're doing is something else so important. Well, I don't feel incredible I just feel it's a big job and you know if anybody's going to change it, it's going to be me because I care about them and I will do yeah. I will change this system I will you, you and I share the same that we're here to make a difference. And yeah, totally. Like, I will. And thank yeah. you so much for having me. No, yeah, well, thank you for being a part of it. Like, you know, it's Pleasure. a big deal and uh, absolutely wonderful. And so, um, right, we have to say goodbye. Goodbye. Sarah. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Bye.